There are some other features of Hebrew poetry to watch out for as you read. And examining it this way, you actually get a lot more out of the poetry if you're aware of what's going on. Often when we read, we just kind of rush over things, but taking some time to look through the Psalms, especially the one that you are going to do your interpretive paper for, is very helpful. Another aspect of Hebrew poetry is the use of word pairs in the parallel line. So here we have hear and give ear are a word pair. All you peoples and all inhabitants are a pair. Low and poor are a pair. High and rich. My mouth and my heart are a pair. Wisdom and understanding. Going on to give thanks and to sing praises, our word pair. Lord, O Most High, a word pair. Steadfast love and faithfulness, morning and night. Music and melody go together. Lute and the harp and lyre go together. This actually is, is sort of part of the technique of using parallelism. There is something else which is called chiasm. And this is where the word order is switched. So here, for the Lord knows, the verb comes first, and then the way of the righteous, the object. But in the second line, the object comes first, the way of the wicked, and then will perish. In the second example, I called is toward the beginning, and then I cried for help at the end. Upon the Lord is the end to my God at the beginning of the half verse. Another technique that is found is to use what is called an inclusio. That means that a passage can start and end with the same verse as it for example, in Psalm 8, O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth, is in both verses 1 and in 9. There are some um, passages uh, in uh, Lamentations and in Psalms that use what is called an acrostic. And this is this is hard to recognize if you're not reading in Hebrew because it's totally impossible to translate. What some of the Psalms do, what, what some things in what uh, passages in Lamentations do, is they construct the poetry so that either each line or each verse, or as in Psalm 119, eight lines at a time all begin with successive letters of the alphabet. So here, the first line in Hebrew begins with the first letter of the alphabet. The second half of the first verse begins with the second letter of the alphabet and so on. In Psalm 119, the first eight lines begin with the first letter of the alphabet. The next eight lines begin with the second, etc. Okay, this points out the, the craft and the skill which the poet is using. There is figurative language and metaphor all over the poetry. And it is important to recognize this because there are lots of figures of speech or metaphors or figurative language that is not to be taken literally. So, for example, in Psalm 23, the psalmist speaks of the Lord as his shepherd. Well, this is a, this is figurative. Obviously, the poet is not an actual sheep. 
but he views his relationship with God as one having to do with the re, uh, shepherd and the sheep. Sometimes, as in Job, you can have some of the techniques extending beyond individual verses. And so, for example, in the speech of Elihu in Job 32, there are, he in the first one says, I am young in years and you are aged. Therefore, I was timid and afraid to declare my opinion to you. And I said, let the days speak and many years teach wisdom, which is paralleled to the first part of verse 6. And then 9 is also antithetic to the lines in verse 6, I am young in years and you are aged. So the poetry extends into larger passages. Now one of the more controversial aspects of Hebrew is whether or not it has meter and rhythm. Classical poetry and poetry from other parts of the world can often have a very strict rhythm, meter, which, which is uh, patterns of stress, or even very um, strict syllable counting. So, for example, what is called dactylic hexameter, as in Homer's Iliad and Odyssey and Virgil's Aeneid, has what are called six feet. Um, you have a, a dactyl, a long and two short syllables, or a spondy, two long syllables. So if you count the stress in an English translation, sing, goddess, the anger of Peleus, son of Achilles. That's six feet, six stresses. In the Aeneid arms and the man I sing who forced by fate. Again, that six. Arma verumque cano, Troy qui primus ad oris, ab oris. Okay, so it's six feet. Each foot having a dactyl, which is a long and two short syllables, or a spondy, two long syllables. Haiku, for example, counts the sound very strictly. You have to have a total of 15 syllables. An old silent pond, five. A frog jumps into the pond, seven, splash, silence again. So it's a pattern of five, seven, five. I guess that's 17, not 15. In later English poetry, there was a frequent use of what is called iambic pentameter. So an iamb is a foot if it consists of one unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable. Okay, and then a line of iambic pentameter consists of five sets of unstressed syllables followed by stressed syllables. So let's look and see how this works out in John Milton. Listen for the five stresses of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree 
whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe with loss of ease until one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat. Okay, when you read it, it doesn't sound that mechanical, but that is the underlying structure of much later English poetry. There probably is no set meter in Biblical Hebrew poetry. Instead, scholars will talk about rhythm where because in parallelism you tend to have rather short terse lines to, uh, in parallel to one another sort of by default when it ends up with similar stresses usually two to four and those the lines within a parallelism tend to have the same number of stresses there is one exception which is in uh, the lament form. We see this a lot in the Book of uh, Lamentations. This is called Kina meter, where the rhythm is to have three stresses and then two. Now you have to understand that in Hebrew, this is not syllables, but rather each word has a stress. So in Lamentations 3.25, the three stresses are, is good the Lord to those who wait for him, or the Lord is good to those who wait for him. Is good has one stress, the Lord has one stress to those who wait for him. The parallel line to the soul that seeks him, okay, two stresses. To the soul is one stress that seeks him is the second stress. So it's a 3-2 pattern. However, you don't really need to worry much about that because rhythm cannot be accurately translated in most cases. 